Secret Gallery podcast. <laughs> at, at, at the Secret Gallery. The Secret Podcast the secret live point. from the Secret Gallery. Not yeah. live. The secret Podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Secret Podcast from the Secret Gallery. I'm Chris Minnick, and I'm here today, as always, with Philip Barish. Today, we're going to be talking with Colin Chillag. We're really excited about this. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to mention that the Secret Podcast is brought to you by Sweet Relief Cannabis here in Story, Oregon on Commercial Street. And you can go to sweetrelief420.com to sign up for the newsletter, get special offers, and all of that. So without further ado, uh, take it away, Philip. All right. So uh, call and welcome. I'm looking very forward to this conversation. And uh, as I said earlier, I spent the morning looking at an enormous amount of your work while listening to Miles Davis, and those two things go together really well. So what I would like to do is just kind of launch into um, the pieces that are actually in the secret gallery now. And uh, what I'm seeing in those in these pieces in particular, having spent the last few hours looking at a lot of your work online, is that um, – I was responding to your work in terms of a, a, of a definite kind of collision between process and product, and that the pieces that are in the secret gallery, the anonymous portraits in particular, to me, there's much more of a harmonious relationship between those two. And I want to know if you would speak to that, if that, if that is true. There just seems to be more harmony and more equality in how your process and your product are actually articulated in themselves. Is, is that true? Um, yeah, I'm, t- I'm trying to think uh, how to approach that question. I think you're probably thinking a little bit of uh, the current work in relation to my older work, which had Correct. Uh, often, Correct. That is often, uh, often had a kind of unfinished quality to it, whereas these uh, more recent ones are, uh, you know, more traditionally kind of... Uh, completed uh with figure and landscape and and that kind of thing um i i'm not sure exactly when that transition uh took place i had had a variety of reasons for um why i worked uh the way i did in the past um and i guess i just sort of grew out of that um uh, with uh, some of the current work, it's, I don't know, I guess a, a, an increasing, I don't know, almost a conservative um, sense I have about me just in terms of uh, the history of painting and how my work relates to a lot of uh, more traditional uh, traditional painting. So I, I guess I, you know, I'm just I mean, one way of approaching that is is to just say I'm, you know, I'm I'm really focused on making uh, good paintings. Uh, I mean, in a in a traditional sense, you know, composition and you know, figure in a landscape. It's all it all feels quite connected uh, to the past, um, and and I like I like being there, you know, instead of instead of I guess. Uh, a more reactionary sort of a approach, you know. Um, I don't know if that's just something that's happened with uh, with age, but 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 the, but it feels very much like that to me. Like I'm I'm increasingly um, I don't know in a way kind of connected to the history of painting in a in, in a, as you know, as sort of conservative as it might sound in the, in the traditional sense. Okay. If well, that we, makes sense. well, it doesn't, <laughs> you know, I'm glad that you brought up the history of painting because I'll tell you right now that the thing in terms of looking at these recent paintings that I really respond to, and you, you know, right out of the gate, you're already talking about it is that, uh, it's not so much that I saw these as more finished works in terms of the stuff that I've seen previous. You know, the ideas are still pretty much equally divided in my eye between product and process. And 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 so I'll be specific in terms of the paintings here. Like when I'm looking at one, the anonymous portrait number three, to me, there is a very deconstructive quality in terms of the Hudson Valley painters, that there's an homage almost to Bierstadt uh-huh. and to Thomas Moran. Um, 
And so th- the fact that you would have, and it's a very, it's a, it's very, very much along those lines of the history of landscape painting that you've destruct, deconstructed in a way that you're now reconfiguring it as less of an element because the, the figure now is becoming dominant. But there's still very much um, an homage to that school of painting. And in fact, in all of the landscape paintings that I looked at this morning, is there seems to be a very prevalent piece of your understanding and your embracing of American landscape painting, and particularly the work of you know Thomas Moran and Cole and, and Bierstadt. So yeah. um, tell me about that, because I know that most people are looking at your paintings in terms of foreground and figures, but the backgrounds are equally important and they really have a lot to do with how you view American art. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to figure this out. It, it, it definitely feels right to me. First of all, there's a deep respect for those painters and uh, the landscape, American landscape painting genre um, in particular, and, and also of a of a regional nature. I'm I live in Phoenix, so you know there's a, a history of you know regional southwestern landscape painting that I've always uh, really liked. So, um, but. I, I, I don't know. There's, there are a number of things, as I said, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out about it. So I, I guess, first of all, you know, it's like I just said, there there's a deep sincerity about my uh, my. Uh, I, I guess you could say love for that, that that type of work. There's nothing, you know, ironic about it. I mean, there might, it might be possible to interpret it that way, but, but to me, it's, it is deconstructed to a certain extent, but it, but it's, it's very sincere at the same time. Um, and I did a uh, quite a bit of landscape painting when I was, uh, mostly when I was younger. And that's something I want to, uh, get back into. Um, it, you know, there there's this other aspect, and I, I keep saying this, but I'm still trying to figure it out and, like, how the pieces all fit together. But um, I don't know. There's a kind of uh, ideological uh, prevalence of, of a sort of disdain for uh, American history and, and you know, all, you know, and this this is, you know, and and for uh and certainly within the art world i think there's a a deep cynicism about uh about that whole history and a lot of these landscapes conjure up uh you know things having to do with the battled past or manifest destiny or these types of things and i i you know as i get older i tend to think this these uh these sorts of viewpoints are, are very uh, limited, you know, and and uh, and I don't I don't know exactly how that fits into uh, the work. But but I and, and I don't know if I you know, this is exactly where you want to go with this conversation. But I actually uh, uh, increasingly, again, as I get older, have a, a real appreciation for, you know, the fact that, you know, I the privilege of just being, you know, born in this place in this time, you know, it's like winning the historic lottery as far as, <laughs> as I'm concerned. And, uh, and that's our, our history, you know, as, as checkered as, and problematic as it may be. Um, so I, again, I like that connection to the history of the country. They tend to be American landscapes and to the history of painting in this culture. You know, I, I don't like the idea of, of, of throwing all these things out, you know, and, 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 uh, and so I, I like to, I guess I like the idea of sort of uh, appropriating and, but in a, in a respectful manner and, and, uh, uh, and I guess you know revisiting in a in a certain sense that that history. Yeah, well, it's really interesting because 
it's not just that you're like revisiting it, but but some of the things I was thinking about, particularly with the Hudson River School, is that it was about mm-hmm. discovery, exploration, settlement. You know, they're highly idealized. You know, reflection of God. You know, they're they're pastoral, they're harmonious, all that stuff. And so you you've all that stuff, all that Im- all that material is built into the fact that you're paying tribute to American landscape painting, and now you have these figures that are placed in Mm -hmm. front of the paintings. And I'm not going to go so far as to say there's political commentary there. I don't think there is. I think it's more along the lines of of kind of social commentary. So I want to take this to the next step and say that um, earlier when I alluded to the fact that I felt that you had harmony between your ideas and your product, your process, and how you viewed American uh, painting is that you you're often called a, a hyper realist, or you or, or in, influenced by hyper realism more more realistically, and so there you have a school of thought that has you know definite aesthetic principles. You know the assimilation of photography, social status is worthy for any portraiture. You know recognition recognition of humanity. There's all that stuff built in there, and you now have those ideas placed in front of your your tribute to American landscape paintings. So really where I'm going with this is the, is the paintings that are in the secret gallery now to me really embody in very equal amounts, those ideas um, where I felt you were wrestling with them in earlier work. Is it, is that, do you feel that way? Well, I think you you put your finger on, on on one of the things I'm trying to figure out with these new paintings, and that is, uh, you know, the figure and landscape relationship. Who are these people and why are they, uh, you know, juxtaposed uh, against this particular type of landscape that has, you know, its tradition in, you know, the the foundation of, of this country. So that's, that's where, uh, the exploration lies. I, and I'm, tr- I'm trying to navigate my way through that, um, without, uh, without, uh, I guess, you know, doing the obvious things, um, uh, in relation to, um, you know, who these people are. I like a certain amount of ambiguity um, and just to sort of avoid the obvious um, narratives when it comes to uh, issues of race and gender and and so forth uh, in relation to, you know, the, the history and of, of the country. Um, so it's a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky territory. Um, for, for the time being, I, I seem, uh, kind of content to just paint these portraits. And this is a part of this is, see, there, the other thing is a lot of this is just like a personal, um, thing as well. Like uh, I keep painting, uh, portraits of women and, um, and, and they're, they're, they are the figures of in in uh, in these landscapes. So um, um, there are a variety of reasons uh, for that. I mean, some of them are just you know kind of personal psychological uh, things that I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to figure <laughs> out. And then there's this other very complex issue of you know what we kind of brushing on with the history of the country. So it's all, it's all very much a work in progress, but like, like I say, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. It, it feels like it could easily go into a very cliched sort of, uh, direction, um, and commentary on, uh, these, uh, you know, the, again, the history of the country and, um, and, uh, and I, I guess I'm just trying to keep it somewhat, uh, uh, ambiguous in, in for the time being anyway. Um, I don't, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, well, exactly. and it seems to me that it, these, the recent portraits in particular, first of all, they're all anonymous. So you've already uh-huh. removed the fact that we would care about who these people are in terms of any kind of, you know, social significance. And so now they're ordinary people. And in this case, they're ordinary women. But, but one of the things that's happened here is that you are, 
taking an enormous amount of time and energy to kind of emphasize their very ordinariness. And so one of the things I really appreciate is that it doesn't matter who they are. These are just very ordinary, very pedestrian, just people. And like I say, in this case, it's girls. And so once again, I can't help but feel that in looking at, you know, your, your previous work, where, where one of the things that seemed was very important to you was the idea that ordinary people really are worthy of portraiture, that, you know, humanity is for all of us. It's not just for those that are of privilege or class and that you've taken that idea and you've now presented it in, you know, once again, against the context of American landscape, but they're still just very ordinary people in that landscape. And now they're, they're finished, you know, in your earlier work, where you have the layers of process open to be exposed and where we can actually see not just how you paint physically, you know, not just your relationship with paint and the surface, but also your relationship with memory and, and the memory of history and the memory of art and, and the implication of the memory of your personalities that you're painting. All of that now is in, in these recent pieces all comes together in a very distilled way. And so it's, it's really interesting to see that. Now, you know, you may say that it, it'd be easy to fall into some kind of, you know, cliche and, and I guess it would be, but I think you're far too clever to let that happen because the line from what I've looked at from work that I've been looking at all morning to where it is now is a very direct line in my eye in terms of your development as an artist. So um, wh- what do you what do you think about that? It, it, I, that's an interesting take. It, it, it's actually. A, a nice context to, in which to think about it that you know uh, just grounding things more in a in a, I suppose a historic context but also um, you know in, in terms of my own personal development and uh, increasing knowledge and awareness of uh, of history and uh, you know our place within it um maybe that accounts for the the more fully realized uh way that i'm uh constructing these paintings um i mean that i like i like that idea um and you know perhaps it it makes some sense um uh yeah i i'm not i'm not sure exactly uh I don't know. I'm not sure what to what to add to that. Um, you know, these are very much uh, it's kind of a series in progress, and I I don't know. I guess I like uh, like a certain amount of of mystery <laughs> involved. It's nice <laughs> to analyze uh, uh, what you do, and uh, but but I guess I work within a I guess more by feel. You know, I I seem to like a I don't know, a kind of being neither here nor there kind of a, a feel about things. Um, and once they become uh, solidified conceptually, um, I, I don't know. I guess I'm used to uh, <laughs> um, uncertainty, you know, and, and just the whole mystery of why I'm doing uh, these things and, and, and that that may be <laughs> revealed at some point. But but uh, but you just ruined it for me, man. Because now, <laughs> <laughs> Colin, if I can ask you a question, <laughs> well, Colin, you know, I, I, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, Colin, Colin, how do you pick the subjects for your portraits? Uh, where do you where do you find these people? Uh, just endless endless Google searches uh, f- for uh, just photographs I just go through Mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of them. I'm I'm particularly attracted to uh, uh, color photography from like the seventies and uh, a little from the eighties in that uh, time range. I don't know. uh, Well, certainly because that's when I was a child. So there's a, you know, a kind of, I suppose, nostalgic uh, connection to that. But but I also 
as objectively as I can look at it, I think I think it was a really beautiful period for photography. I mean, you know how the uh, the quality of and and uh, technology, of course, changes so quickly. But that seems to have been and the '60s as well. Or but that seems to have been a really as far as I'm concerned, a, a, a really interesting period in, in mm-hmm. photography. So I'm attracted to that and often of an amateurish quality, uh, the photographs I choose, um, uh, that, that appeals to me probably again for nostalgic reasons. Um, so I, I kind of, I, I don't know. I just, I find those images easy to, to, expand upon and work upon and sort of, you know, apply, uh, my imagination to, I suppose, uh, um, you know, like, uh, perhaps some triggering something in my memory and, uh, you know, a kind of childlike approach to them probably, uh, comes to bear on that. So, um, I, yeah, so it's that period of, uh, Photography is usually what I look for. And then, um, but then of course, uh, other, you know, uh, increasingly I'm using these, uh, landscapes from the history of American painting. So, um, but yeah, just endless searches for images and, uh, saving one here and there. And then, and but, then but in I, your uh, searches, and you were just yeah. saying this because it's another thing that seems to be really important to your work. In your searches, when you find an image, regardless of what it is, it it triggers off at some level memory because the way you approach your pieces in terms of how you then take that photograph and turn it into a painting is there's a lot of of just memory in the way you paint. There's a lot of the you know the idea of memory, the implication of memory. What, how accurate, how disloyal, how ridiculous is memory? So, I, mm. I think you know when you're saying that you're you're sifting through and looking for pieces. There there are pieces that then would have to like um, call to you. They, they would have to speak to you because in all the stuff that I was looking at this morning, memory is embedded underneath all of it. Your ideas of memory are seem to be really, really important. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's very much an intuitive uh, process when I you know uh, I go through just thousands of images and you know one in, in a thousand will um, will trigger something. It just you know it will capture my interest and and it could be any number of things. Uh, uh, what was it? Roland Barth wrote a book that I liked uh, called uh, Camera Lucida, and he he was uh, just talking about the role that f- photography plays in in our lives. He had a term called uh, the punctum, which yes, it, it's kind oh, of I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, kind of a, a mysterious uh, notion whereby something in a photograph, it, and it could be any number of things, often very subtle, just triggers something in you. It it just focuses your interest, and and uh, and it's worth analyzing, uh, I suppose, later what that thing is or why it is. I mean, it could be whatever a, a buckle on a shoe or something like that. Um, or, or often uh, a subtle expression on a face or something like that. Um, and so those things occur, uh, I'm sure subconsciously. And then I, I just, uh, I just go with, with those, you know. Well, and you did a series of paintings that were actually called that and they were numbered. And it, it's, oh, it's yeah. funny you brought that up because if you hadn't brought it up, I was going to. <laughs> um, mm. It's because it, it, it's it's really interesting that you have, you know, what is it's a it's a small, distinct point. I was thinking of pointillism, too. I was thinking of George Surratt and wondering if that came into play, because these particular paintings technically are they're they're different than the other ones I looked at. Something was triggered. Maybe there was some deeply embedded um, subconscious memory that was triggered when you did the punctums because I spent a lot of time looking at those images and seeing how you 
came back on top of the images was as if you were a little kid, as if you had a crayon or a, a Sharpie marker or something. There's something that got released when you did those series of paintings. And so, you know, it might be an overreach me to think in terms of pointillism because, you know, I know that your, your pieces technically are really very sophisticated. And does that come into play or is that just something that I'm just thinking about because of the nature of the term? Is that where you were you like thinking of Surat? Were you thinking about how you were actually applying paint to the painting or was it more about the memory that was triggered when you found the image for the painting? Um, well, no, that's interesting. You bring up pointillism. I hadn't really made that connection, to be honest with you, but but I can see how you you might. Um, I I've the technique is kind of evolving into something uh, sort of similar, um, a, a slightly blurry quality. Um, I, I wonder sometimes whether. It, it's because my eyes are not as good as they used to be. <laughs> like I'm <laughs> starting to think I need glasses or something. And so they used to be a really uh, tight, tight kind of realism that I, I, I was doing. And now it's, it's uh, more diffused and, and, and a bit blurry um, at times. Um, uh, but, uh, but, yeah, you know, you also mentioned the kind of emotional uh, quality of of or, or a reaction, and and that's very much uh, part of you know the appeal of the the images. Uh, again, you know, it tends to be kind of subconscious, and uh, I'm not I'm not exactly sure, you know, as we so often are not what why we're reacting to a certain thing, you know, and, and undoubtedly, you know, they have connections to our early childhood or, 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 or way the hell back, you know, in our evolutionary history. I mean, <clears throat> it's, there's no, there's no telling, but there is that emotional, uh, response. And that is, that was also something, um, uh, uh, Barth uh, recognized, you know, in 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 that term and uh, an idea of uh, the punctum, um, which, which is and it's an interesting term. Um, I mean, as as you guys as as writers could probably appreciate this. Um, the the term it. It's original in his usage as applied to photography, but the original term uh, had to do with well, there are a few uh, there are a few definitions. One is just uh, like a medical instrument, the point, uh, uh, like a piercing or pointed medical instrument, a punctum. But the other one is it's actually an, a part of the anatomy of the eye. In fact, it's the opening of the tear duct. The tear so, duct, yes, yes. So, uh, you know, it, it has a kind of relation to uh, emotions and tears as well as, you know, a point uh, it, that sort of triggers that emotional or pierces the heart in a way you might say, uh, and triggers that emotional response. Uh, so I just thought it was kind of a fascinating term, but all of that kind of applies, uh, just naturally to the process. I think when, when, uh, choosing these photographs, at least for me, you know, and hopefully for the viewer as well. Yeah, well, and one, I'll just point this out again in terms of how it responded to the punctums, you know, and, and it, as as a body of work, because I, I saw them all distinctly. And, and let me ask you this first. Did they all come up together? Was it a single body of work that rose up together? Or was it a chronological sequencing on those? Because they are numbered, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Did you number them at the uh, end of finishing them or did you number them as they yeah. went? Yeah, I think basically it was an afterthought. Um, I, I kind of grouped them uh, 
later. I mean, my process is, <laughs> is, is, is not so linear, you know, I tend to, uh, it's, it's more like, uh, falling down the stairs, I suppose. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, making sense of the mess at the, at the bottom. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, largely working intuitively. And then, um, well, well, that is an interesting uh, idea. I mean, what, what, it, what comes first, you know, um, uh, the, the, uh, it, it seems I work intuitively and then the ideas uh, arise and they create the kind of context as I go along. And then later in, in a, I guess in the evolution of a, a period of work or a body of work, uh, I start to work more intentionally with a, with a concept in mind. And, and, uh, and that might be a, sort of towards the end of the, of the process. For some reason that starts to, it feels like that, that starts to trigger, uh, uh, the diminishment of my interest in uh, the work or in that body of work. Um, so, uh, and I'm, I feel like with these new paintings, I'm very much in that uh, kind of, that's why it's a little bit difficult to talk about because I'm, 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 I'm still figuring it out, you know. But it's good to hear your input and your yeah. interpretation. Well, of all and this. like I said, the new paintings, they look they look and feel very differently than all the other stuff I've been looking at. And that's, you know, once again, I'm, I'm just it just feels like your ideas about product and about process, about memory, about all the things that I've seen in looking at your work have all come together now in a much more harmonious way. And I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to say that your other, the earlier work is, is not harmonious, but you're very much kind of letting it hang out there. Like let's talk about the, the landscapes. Well, they're more like cityscapes or urban scapes that you did in, or in the Arizona area where the image occupies essentially the center of the canvas. And as you get to the outer images and edges of the image, it kind of dissolves and it becomes mm -hmm. much more about, not only process, but you can see the bones and you can see the strata. You can see the archaeology, the literal archaeology of how you paint, but then the figurative archaeology of what it is you're painting. And so, you know, you live in a place in the world that has vast expanses. You live in a place where there's amazing landscapes and these landscapes are now becoming occupied by things like gas stations and, you know, 7-Elevens or Circle Ks or whatever they are. So in the pieces that I was looking at, the landscape is very much present, but now it has been basically tainted or, or um, <laughs> ruined by these man-made objects that as you paint them, you expose you expose them for what they are in terms of being eyesores and kind of garbage and then move out to the outer edges where you just expose who you are in terms of the artist making these images. So I would like you to talk a little bit about that. Um, I, I, uh, I, I'm not sure about, um, <clears throat> it depends on, um, I think, uh, I don't know that the sort of temporal time frame one has, uh, <laughs> if it's, you know, uh, if it's, you know, a, a relatively short human scale, um, time frame, it, you know, things, you know, it, it certainly looks like we're <laughs> fouling our nest. Um, and, and that's, uh, uh, uh an obvious concern in, environmentally um but you know over that larger time scale um you know one one good natural catastrophe <laughs> does uh does can do global damage and uh and, and certainly regional damage uh you know and and so i i'm not I, i'm not sure uh ex you know, I don't feel like I'm uh, any kind of an activist type artist um, in 
in the environmental sense. Uh, but but these are certainly this is certainly the, the obviously the world we live in, and so um, more or less, I just feel like you know that's what I depict, um, and there's certainly a lot of uh, ugliness to you know what humans do within the landscape. Uh, um, but, uh, but, but, you know, we're trying to figure it out, I suppose, as a species, uh, it's, it's only fairly recently that we've had these abilities to just, you know, destroy the world. I suppose. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it turns out, as it turns out, we're pretty good at it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I well, and I just you, just to follow up in, in terms of talking about those paintings is that you still made the decision to have whatever it is, a gas mm-hmm. station in the center of the painting mm-hmm. and then reveal your painting structure at the outer edges, which would imply oh. to me that you started from the center and yeah. worked out. Is that is that what you did or did you work on the perimeter and then move in? Uh, I think it's more from the center out. Um uh, like you suggest, um, uh, part of that, one of the reasons for that was, um, I, I guess I was thinking about just perception, uh, uh, the way our eyes and minds work and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, how you, you can focus on one area, but there's, uh, you know, just a billion bits of information in our, in our periphery that, uh, you know, we might only, uh, that we aren't consciously aware of. It's like your consciousness just focuses on one area at a time, but you kind of subconsciously take in the environment. And, and so it, it, it just, uh, seemed like that way of painting had, had a relationship to that, uh, that basic, uh, way, uh, aspect of, of, consciousness and perception so i kind of thought of uh of the creation of those paintings as uh, just a, you know a little bit of a just ro- roving observation it, it you know it, it's here in detail focus in depth and in detail on this area and this area and this area and this area but but then it, it sort of dissolves into just a, a you know a general atmosphere. Um, so it, it just felt like it had uh, a kind of uh, some sort of truthful resonance just in relation to uh, the human perception in that way. And, and the, and the, and they tend to be rather mundane uh, subject matter, everyday types of experiences. And, uh, and and that uh, that uh, that ability to find absolute uh, I don't know just beauty and fascination in the everyday uh, experience uh, I for me realism like that's at the heart of realism for me is uh, the idea that, uh, you know, everyday reality is uh, beautiful enough and interesting enough and meaningful enough if you pay attention to it. And, and, and so I, I think I was after, I was meditating a lot at that, at, <clears throat> at that time. <clears throat> and so um, the, that that it connected to that uh, quite a bit uh, those those paintings as well. Um, yeah, if, well, if that makes so, sense. well, another thing that I want to point out that in terms of the evolution that I see in terms of what I would call current art history that you know you in in reading about you hyper realism comes up quite a bit and the thing that mm. about the hyper realism is that. The painters of hyperrealism, I'll just say, you know, Dennis Peterson and Bechtel and um, Richard S. Days in particular, for me, they embalmed the image and it left me cold. What what I see you doing is using hyperrealism as a springboard 
to say that I can make the mundane and the ordinary beautiful. But at the same time, it's really about me standing here at this easel making a painting that I think mm-hmm. that hyper you're like post hyper realism in the terms that you've, you've, you've learned what needed to be learned from that movement and you've applied it in a way that makes sense for you and you've moved it forward. And so the way it was articulated, particularly in the gas station, circle K paintings, all of, you know, that series for me was like, Oh my God, he's, he's taken hyper realism and he's moved it to the next level and and disconnected it from its really very kind of what I found to be very cold and calculating. Like I said, those paintings in particular leave me cold because they feel embalmed. Your pieces are not embalmed if for no other reason they reveal the structure of how they're made. So is, is that part of your intent? Yeah, absolutely. Um it, it, I, I think I had a, a, I don't know, some a kind of a a problem, uh, in in that um, it, it, it just the the um, you know realism is uh, I don't there's a contradiction at the heart of it, and I think this is true of all art to one extent or another. Um, and, and that is, you know, you're creating something, uh, you're creating an illusion. Uh, it's to some extent, uh, deceptive, uh, but, but you're trying to reveal something that, you know, you believe to be true while doing so. Uh, so there's this inherent contradiction in that and, and I, I don't know why that bothered me exactly, um, but I I decided to take it a step further and uh, and just reveal, like you're pointing out, as as much of the process as possible, um, and 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 that was what at that time interested me uh, deeply. Again, it was connected very much to this meditation practice, which was kind of intense at the time. Um, And so that all, that all seemed to fit together well for me. And I was, uh, I don't know, I was, I was happy at the time for having, uh, I felt content with those paintings for a time for having, um, I don't know, made a, a bridge between um, the, the the thing I was depicting and the process by which it was depicted. It all felt uh, it all felt honest and 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 just completely like you know open and and you know w- without. Uh, without anything like uh, uh, deception of any sort. Um, I, anyway, I took, I took some, kind, some kind of satisfaction in that at the time. Um, but, you know, it, it, it felt like a, a kind of exercise. Uh, uh, let's see how, almost like let, how, how pure, <laughs> how pure and honest can, can, can we be at, can I be as as an artist? You know, I just want to yeah, yeah. put it all, yeah, well, like, put it all out. <laughs> well, and it's funny too because, like, there's the things that I was thinking about. You know, in those in that particular series, also was that you know there seems to be the question is can can pictorial representation actually be objective truth? I think it feels Ooh. to me like that was being struggled with. And then the next thing that I thought about and looking at the images, just how I responded to what you were doing is it felt like you were deconstructing high resolution in your search for kind of objective truth. It just seems like that stuff was embedded in there. It's like, it's, it's why I responded so strongly to those pieces. So is that stuff in there? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I'm, it's nice to hear that, you know, your interpretation that you picked up on that. I, I, uh, yeah, I think so. 
in my intention anyway. I think so. So um, yeah. here's one of the ironies. I just have to point this out too because it's really it's 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 just so ironic to spend time looking at digital images on the internet of paintings which have scale and mass. And you're painting. Some of them are pretty sizable. I mean, you you know you you work fairly large. And so it's really interesting to see everything scaled down to where it's all uniform. And it's one of the great privileges of being able to see your originals, like at the secret gallery, to stand in front of them and understand that scale matters. So talk a little bit about scale and how you determine your choices. Yeah, that's I, I find scale to be this uh, just an incredibly complex uh, thing that uh, it, it, it's it remains kind of a mystery to me. Like uh, um, sometimes you just nail the scale uh, perfectly, and and of course it's it's much more complicated than you know blowing it up or reducing it in size. It, it comes down to you know the the scale of the brush strokes in relation to the size of the work and and um, and. And, uh, you know, the, the size of the painting in relation to the size of the room and all these different relationships within and without and, and beyond uh, the painting itself. So um, it, it, it's it, it's something it's a hit and miss sort of process with with scale. Uh, I do like to uh, work a bit larger when I can. Um I, I like, I often like, uh, in the past anyway, more so than now, I liked uh, a scale of uh, the figures to be, <clears throat> when I was doing portraits, to be just slightly, like maybe 15% larger than life um, or, or something like that. That gave them a, a kind of uncanny presence uh, I felt in, in in terms of uh, the scale of the figures uh, and some of the the past work uh, these ones uh, tend to be a little bit under uh, life size um, um, and so I'm kind of working in that range a bit but but again pretty close to life size but just maybe a little larger or a little smaller that seems to be kind of an interesting range for me to work in. Um, but it can vary quite a bit. And, and sometimes I'll just feel like, you know, I have a, a good painting plotted out that I want to do and I just miss on the scale. So when I, I create the painting, it, it, you know, it doesn't have the kind of presence or impact that I was hoping. And then other times I, I sort of feel like I get lucky and the scale is, is perfect somehow. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, uh, you know, a, again, a, a kind of a hit and miss process, but it's very important. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting too, because one of the things about scale and when I was looking at your paintings and, uh, you know, Western family, which was at the secret gallery, which is a magnificent painting and it's a large painting. And I was thinking, well, does a large painting then mean that there's bigger ideas than you might find in smaller works. The thing about looking at your works is that all the ideas are uniform. So I don't, I didn't see that a large scale work like Western family dictated its size by saying these are big ideas. I just saw that in terms of how you approach things from a formal standpoint as a painter, you just needed a larger canvas in order to convey those messages. Those messages aren't any greater than smaller pieces. And I guess that's really what I was so curious about scale because uh, I'm not going to say you're all over the board, but your ideas are, are uniform and they're strong enough that they can be um, substantiated at, at any in any size. Uh, well, that, that Western family painting was kind of funny because the scale of the, the figures was... Uh, <laughs> was <laughs> was uh it, it varied quite a bit that was one of the fun things about that painting for me and a kind of psychological impact uh, you had about three maybe four different scales of the of the figures of in the family um <laughs> some, yeah, well, of, some, of the, 
And the correct. family is very cartoonish. And I don't mean that yeah. in, like in a negative way, but there's a cartoonish mm-hmm. aspect to them that makes it, it's, it's a funny painting. You know, it's just funny. Yeah. Well that, yeah, that scale, uh, that scale works on the, um, the proportions of the figure as well. That's another thing I've been uh, exploring recently. Uh, the, the figures are, um, slightly caricaturesque um, <clears throat> and maybe more than slightly in some cases um, and just the proportions and the kind of distortions uh, going on with the figures has been really interesting to me. Um, yeah, uh, I think, you know, like in uh, uh, some Renaissance or Mannerist painting, uh, you know, there's a lot of elongated figures with, small hands and relatively small heads. And this gave, I think, imbibed a kind of elegance uh, and, uh, I don't know, ethereal or uh, maybe even holy quality to the figures. Uh, And then the opposite of that would be like cartoonish work uh, where the heads and hands tend to be way oversized. And it's a, I don't know, a a kind of more, I want to say like hedonistic and earthly kind of, uh, of, uh, of a feel to the figures. And and my work, my work increasingly tends towards uh, the latter. I think very, very earthly mortal type figures. Yeah. Okay, so so Dale Irby <laughs> was he a hedonist? <laughs> Tell me about Dale Irby. <laughs> I kept his proportions pretty accurate. Uh, I I I didn't uh, I didn't know a, a whole lot. I just knew the basics about about Dale. Um, and I I mean I I did I don't think I had a whole lot of to add to those portraits. I just I just really loved that uh you know that sort of documentation that that guy uh created of of yeah, himself yeah. Over. So i think i can add a little bit here to go this ahead. story yeah do it yeah, oh, for yeah. Our listeners, we should let them know about the dale irby series so go ahead chris no, uh, yeah dale dale irby called me up um a few weeks ago <laughs> and and i had i had a quite a good conversation with dale irby uh, and he said, I, saw, I see this guy, Colin uh, Chillig, painted a bunch of paintings of me. And it uh, looks like <laughs> you guys even sold a few of them. And he said, you know, he got some of the details wrong. Because <laughs> 1973, I wasn't allowed to have a mustache, but I see he painted me there with a mustache. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so this is kind of funny because we've been talking about how Dale Irby, you know, in some of the paintings, he's you he kind of gave him buck teeth, and then in other ones, you know, there's kind of the weird moles and things. And he didn't mention any of that. He just he mentioned the mustache. Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, so, how, how, so how many I, paintings are in the series, and they go from what year to what year? Um, I I didn't hold fast to the years. I just did. Uh, I think in the photo in the in the in the foot in the photos there was I, I believe like forty years of these photographs and I only ended up doing about twenty uh, eight. Yeah, it might have there might have been a few more um, mm-hmm. that I didn't send or that that didn't make the cut. Um, might have been around thirty or thirty two. So. Um, and, and they were just sort of a, a random sampling, uh, uh, of photos I found on the internet. Um, it, but I think they basically went from the beginning of his, uh, career to the end. Yeah. Like 73 to 2012. How do you, how do you decide when to sort of exaggerate features or, um, you know, you, you have certain certain things that you'll do to people, um, just to you, know, you kind of make them a little bit abnormal, and it kind of gives a very disturbing quality to some of your portraits. Just uh, well, I think that's actually one of the reasons I like uh, doing anonymous portraits. Uh, the Dale Irby paintings made me a little uncomfortable, just because. Uh, 
uh, people would recognize him. And then um, it feel, uh, you know, I worry about people. Well, because I'm not real. I don't know the man in that case. And, and you know, I, I, I wasn't making any comment on on him. I mean, in a sense, they're not even. I don't know. That that's a little mm-hmm. a little bit of a strange example, but I like taking these anonymous uh figures uh, from these old photographs and then I feel a little more comfortable manipulating them in a variety yeah. of ways um without, you know, hurting anyone's feelings or uh or anyone thinking it's uh you know, about them. I've had a few bad experiences with people uh, <laughs> recognizing <laughs> themselves in, in the work I do. Um, I think uh, one time I used to paint my friends, uh, like I take a lot of photographs and then uh, do pictures of people and, and most people are fine with it, you know, but, but every once in a while, uh, this one woman, was really upset that I painted her. It was from a pool party. And I, you know, it's like, I, I just didn't think twice about it. She was just a, a normal, uh, person, you know, um, at this yeah. pool party, but she was really upset that I, I painted her, uh, I, she was in her bathing suit and, um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, Anyway, she she was unhappy with that, and then there were a few other experiences uh, where people recognize themselves, and um, and uh, I, they either wanted re- to be reimbursed <laughs> financially. <laughs> they want the royalties. <laughs> yeah, uh, that that's happened, uh, and right. uh, and you know, because I just yeah. It, you know, they take it personally for, for obvious reasons, you know, uh, and for me, I, I don't know, I guess I feel a little bit either like a detached observer, just as objective as possible or else, um, it's, you know, taking all whatever creative liberties I want and as an artist mm. and, and not thinking twice about it, but then you got to relate it back to, well, this is a person, a real person, and um, what what does this say about them, or how would they interpret it? So, anyway, I just I generally like to avoid all of that. You know? Yeah. Well, is, is portraiture something you're continuing yeah. to doing? Like in, in the work you are now doing, what is it? Portraiture is that is it? You're going to mine this for a while. Uh, I I I really like working in that genre for me it's uh i i think it just simply comes down to the fact that we are endlessly fascinated with other people and with their faces and bodies and 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 it is it is you know the focal point of our attention is people's faces and their eyes and and so it feels like uh it just the most, uh, I don't know, maybe in some ways difficult thing, um, uh, to do like, uh, to, to not, to just not avoid, uh, the face, the features and, and just go right to that sort of source of, uh, connection and communication that, uh, the human face, uh, provides. So it, it, it's endlessly fascinating to me. Yeah. Yeah. So it, when, so going back to the hyper realist movement, because I feel you came out of that, correct? I mean, that was one of the tenets is that, you know, the recognition of humanity and the fact that social status should not keep anyone from having portraiture work done of any kind. And it seems to me, if you're drawing from those roots, which are embedded in pretty deeply, at least in the work that I've been looking at all morning, that that all you're doing is acknowledging that and reinventing it in a, in another way. And you, you seem to have reached a level of, of really technical comfort. And, you know, once again, just talking about the anonymous portrait pieces at the secret gallery, you're just, you know, you're, you're there's just, you're so comfortable with what you're doing. Um, yeah, I, I guess there's a, a level of comfort there. Um, from from my perspective, it, it's 
it's incredibly challenging. I mean, it, it, uh, uh, and I mean, isn't that why we, why we do anything or why anything's worthwhile? It's just, you have to work at the, uh, the extent of your abilities. Uh, and it always feels like that to me. Um, especially, uh, well, the whole painting, I mean, uh, it, it feels hard to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> it doesn't but, feel but, hard to me. <laughs> but to, to your point, um, I do feel uh, a certain degree of comfort in, in where I'm at uh, with these portraits right now. It, it, uh, one of the hardest things is, is being, uh, for me, you know, uncertain about what you want to do. Th- those are the, some of the most torturous periods in, in my history as an artist is, 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 is just being, uh, 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 not knowing what to do, not knowing which direction to go in, being confused all the time. And, and, uh, you know, you, you work through it obviously, but, but I, I, I'm just sort of enjoying at least for the time being that this, uh, this body of work that I'm engaged in and I'm, I'm happy to, uh, happy to keep going with it. Um, I like the, I like the simplicity of it, but, but, uh, but it also has, uh, an endless number of possibilities and combinations of, you know, figure and landscape, um, and, uh, you know, an endless number of possible meanings. So it feels like a, a good place, uh, to be in right now. Uh, well, for me. to my eye, they're less work. And I don't mean that your other paintings were difficult. They're, I mean, they're demanding for sure. But the demands that are placed in this new body of work to me are much more palatable. I mean, they're just, I don't know, there, there's just, like I said, there's a, there's a definite measurable harmony that I experience visually with these pieces. And I'm just yeah. talking how I respond visually. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I feel... I feel the same way. And, and it's, it's, it's a really nice place to be at artistically for me at this place in time, uh, because it, most of my history as a painter was uh, more of like combining ve- very often, very disparate ways of working. It was a very much more pluralistic way of painting and and uh, and 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 sort of uh, figuring it out as I went along, and so the paintings felt like they never ended. There was no, you know, they would just go on and on and on, and and often get worse and worse. And it, and it was, <laughs> I mean, or they they reach a point where they were, you know, I, I don't know, fatigue would set in and then uncertainty would set in. And that, that tends to be a pretty bad combination. <laughs> if, if, if you're trying to figure out how to, how to finish something, you know? And so that was a, 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 a pretty frequent sort of experience for me. Uh, these, on the other hand, they feel very much uh, like, you know, there's a, a, a set way to start and there's a set end goal. And, and then I just execute the process, um, which might sound boring, like, uh, like there's less surprises and excitement in the process. And I suppose that's, true to some extent, but, but, you know, I've been painting for 30 years. And so uh, anyway, the point is I like the product more now. Yes. Uh, yes. The- but once again, what I was saying earlier is that you, you, yeah, the product is more refined, you know, there's a higher level oh. of, of distillation, but the ideas in terms of the process are still part of the, the DNA. So in, in looking at your earlier work where, where it was very important for you to reveal process, it was very mm-hmm. important to see the skeleton that then became the thing that here it's all 
kind of embodied as a single unit. And so to my eye, mm-hmm. that's very pleasing because I can now see the, the, the fruition, you know, the fullness of your ideas without having to, and I don't want to say work hard. I, I don't mean that, but these are, are less work in, in the most desirable way. Well, I like to think that all of that history as a painter is somehow, even though these are different and and very much the way you describe them, um, I like to think that that is all in there somehow. Like there's a complexity to these that I've managed to hopefully synthesize. You know, it's like, um, you know, if you have some insight some understanding of something you want to say it in the the most simple and straightforward way uh, so that people, because you want people to understand it. Now, I don't, I don't know how much that is true, but, but I don't, I don't feel like I'm playing too much. uh, Like there's, uh, I'm not trying to, uh, I mean, they are, they are what they are. I'm not, I'm not purposely trying to be, you know, to obfuscate anything or, or, uh, you know, be, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it, or overly mysterious or, or, you know, they, they feel, they feel like, uh, I don't know, the, the end product of a, of a long, of a long process, perhaps. And yes, yeah, yeah, I way. agree with that. Yes. Yes. That it's the culmination of everything that came before it. And it just feels like now you can be relaxed about the exploration of your ideas because you're comfortable with how you do what you do, why you do what you do and how it turns out. So um, that's how it feels to me that this is, th- these are the embodiment of everything that came before it. And there's, to me, they're just, they're charming. I mean, it just, they're very charming pieces and they're, and they're substantive. So it's the right combination to this viewer's eyes. Well, thank you. That's, that's really nice to hear. I I have had that that feeling like, um, and it was surprising to me because there's that I'm actually, I mean, this is fleeting, but that I'm at ease with the work (laughs) I'm producing right now. And, and that, that, in the past, you know, that would be the last thing I would have said about uh, my work, you know, that I'm, uh, you know, but even while I'm saying that, it's like there are an endless number of things that, uh, you know, I can look at and think, you know, that I need to improve upon that and I need to, you know, this should be better. And, you know, that's that's an endless process. So I don't want to exaggerate, you know, my level of contentedness. But it's not all bliss. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, who was it that said there is no inner peace? There is only nervousness and death. I can't remember. Who? <laughs> Great <thing. laughs> um, yeah, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> well, um, I guess I mean we I, maybe we should wrap this up. It's 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 been a pleasure chatting with you. I mean, this yeah, has just too. been great. And I just I I love your work, and I will follow you for you know as long as as we're both alive. I've said that before, but <laughs> it's true. <laughs> And, and, and particularly, uh, yeah, and I, particularly now the the place you've reached, you know, your work is it's you you just you're a really gifted painter. Thanks, Philip. Are are you living uh, out there in Oregon? I am. Yes, not far from Chris. What do you think about that? Yep. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm I'm planning on doing a a long road trip, do some landscape painting and some camping. Um, I'd like. I really would like to do a, a swing through uh, the Pacific Northwest. So hopefully, I'll have a chance to meet up with you guys uh, later this summer. We're looking forward to that. Yeah.